We shall overcome. We shall overcome. Together, we have marched millions of miles to land on the right side of history. And today, we stand firmly planted, hoping only that more will join us one by one until everyone in this nation is truly free and equal. I know you are with the marchers today, in spirit and in solidarity, and I hope that you will follow the news coverage of today's powerful events. Thank you for being part of the historic struggle for civil rights. And now, without further ado, Governor Neil Abercrombie. And uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech, which has commonly uh, come to be called the I Have a Dream speech. That legacy is something that resonates across not just the nation and Hawaii, but across the world. But what it reminds us most particularly of, and I want to particularly remember then, those who have suffered for their humanity, those who have had themselves marginalized, shoved to the edges of society, sometimes isolated, in fact, from it. And so I think it only appropriate in the wake of the designation at Halimahalo in Pearl City of buildings named after those who had been sent away to Kalapapa, that we recall what it is to feel isolated and alone and marginalized and shut out of our common humanity. In a, an address at the United Nations on October 30th, 1997, Bernard Punikaia of Kalapapa and Kalihi gave a speech entitled, A Quest for Dignity. He stood before 300 people there at United Nations uh, Plaza, looked at a photograph taken at Kalihi Hospital when he was six and a half years old. A little boy of six and a half years, taken from his family at the edge of being sent away, shut away. And he said, Upon the face of this child, I see the pain he is enduring. The loneliness is overwhelming. In spirit, I am able to reach out to him, to comfort him, to put my arms around him, and to reassure him that all is not lost. The pain will go away, I tell him. As I look at the photo of a six-and-a-half-year-old boy who was me, something happens. His pain coalesces with my spirit, and that pain is no longer his alone. I want to tell him that the time will come when there will be laughter, when there will be joy, when there will be respect, and yes, dignity. This is a quest for dignity. Just prior to the March on Washington and the speech given by Dr. King, In this city, a young man and woman met and fell in love. The president's mother and father, 
they were married. And that baby was born here in Honolulu, Hawaii, in the land of Aloha. His parents could not have been married in 17 other states, including the state right next to the seat of government of this nation in Washington, D.C., where the I Have a Dream speech was given. A quest for dignity. Regardless of one's station in life, whether high born or low, regardless of one's economic status, regardless of one's race. Think about it. As the biographer of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Taylor Branch, has told us, as color defines vision itself, race shapes the cultural eye. What we do and do not notice, what the reach of empathy is, what the alignment of response, what subliminal force recommends care in choosing a point of view grounded in race, grounded in sex, grounded in orientation, grounded in religion. How infinite the categories we have to be able to separate ourselves from each other. So this is more today than a rally, a rally about equality. This is a demonstration today of whether we will truly be brothers and sisters with and to and for one another. We must rise from an isolated culture into a larger history. We must speak truth that requires a maximum effort to see, as Taylor Branch characterized the efforts of Dr. Martin Luther King on this day, that this was the culmination that day of a movement a movement commonly characterized as the Civil Rights Movement. And to the degree and extent that it was, it can't be argued with. But what in fact is a movement? Taylor Branch says, a movement is faith in strangers. Faith in strangers. I dare say, as I look to those of you assembled here before me, that many of you are strangers to each other. You may never have seen one another before, may never see each other again. And yet we are gathered here together today on the basis of a fundamental faith in and for and about each other, a faith in strangers, strangers no more. Dr. King said on that day, in the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. As I reread the speech uh, again and again, I, I Confess, I hadn't read it in years. I'm as much uh, uh, guilty, I suspect, as many of us of simply observing in passing the I have a dream part of the speech that we've seen again and again, maybe to the point that we almost take it for granted. Well, one of the things I learned about taking things for granted is that you need to remind yourself of what you think is obvious. Because it's the obvious we tend to forget first and take most for granted. And so in some respects, I think it warrants with your kind courtesy, a bit of a recitation, recitation from some of the rest of that speech. I thought about that today. 
Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. How easy it is to slip into a sense of self-righteousness, uh, slip into a sense of uh, that, that uh, there is a struggle uh, for, for which prices have to be paid and extracted from others, and that it's not enough for us to win, somebody else has to lose. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. And I thought that's what inspired me to go back to Bernard's words, a quest for dignity. We must not allow, we must not allow our, our creative protest to degenerate. Speaking of his white brothers and sisters, he said, they have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound with our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must make a pledge that we will always march ahead. We cannot turn back. No, no, we are not satisfied, and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. At Harris United Church, at 3 o'clock, when the bells rang out, here and across the nation, across the entire nation, the waters came down at Harris United Methodist Church. The heavens opened up here in Hawaii, and we were blessed. It wasn't quite a mighty stream, but it will do till one comes along. So then he said, I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail if necessary together, to stand up for freedom together knowing that we will be free one day. I want to thank and commend Speaker Suki and President Kim for their thoughtful leadership with regard to the marriage equity bill. As I thank the Judiciary Chair, Senator Clayton He and Representative Carl Rhodes for their wise counsel and collaboration. I agree with Speaker Suki that with the distribution of the bill, now is the time for discussion, due diligence, and deliberation by all parties. Our administration will be available for that discussion and we welcome it. We want everyone to be able to express their views and with that approach, if and when a special session is called, it will be efficiently conducted, and believe me, it will be productive. Thank you very much. Yeah.